on World News Tonight. Russia condemned. World leaders come together to decry Russia's military pursuit in Ukraine, condemning it as barbaric. Despite this, doubts still arise on imposing even stricter restrictions on the country. Invasion aftermath. Ukraine picks up the pieces weeks after the fateful day of the invasion by Russia. A look into the first fallen city, Kherson, reveals new kinds of oppression. Combating COVID. Africa adds yet another weapon in its arsenal in fighting the spread of the pandemic within the continent as Pfizer's Paxlovid fill makes its way to the continent to ease the situation. Viva Venice! Masked partygoers take strolls in dramatic get-ups and join the iconic cardinal celebrations along the canal. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with updates on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. More and more nations are gathering together to call out Russia on its allegedly barbaric acts in the invasion of Ukraine. World leaders are now mulling a possible joint probe into war crimes committed by Russia. The U.S. specifically being more than prepared to begin. One day after a Russian strike on a maternity hospital in Mariupol sparked widespread condemnation, Vice President Kamala Harris offered U.S. support for an international war crimes investigation into the Russian invasion of Ukraine. After meeting Polish leaders in Warsaw Thursday, Harris said Russia was committing atrocities. We have been witnessing for weeks, and certainly just in the last 24 hours, atrocities of unimaginable proportion. Vice President Harris cited examples including the maternity hospital bombing on Wednesday and scenes of bloodied pregnant women being evacuated. Russia, which calls its actions a special military operation, on Thursday shifted its stance over the bombing with a mix of statements that veered between strong denials and a call by the Kremlin to establish clear facts. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, also in Poland Thursday, warned Russian President Vladimir Putin that Russia's actions would be met with the severest of responses. Putin's callous disregard for human life is absolutely unacceptable. It is very clear that he has made the choice to specifically target civilians now. The world will continue to make Putin accountable for his war crimes. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has accused Russia of carrying out genocide. The European Union called the bombing inhumane, cruel and tragic. And U.S. Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines said that U.S. intelligence officers were documenting Russia's actions in order to hold Moscow and those responsible for assaults on civilians to account. U.S. President Joe Biden said Thursday that more shipments of defensive equipment, food, water and medicine were en route to Ukraine. According to the UN, more than 2.3 million people have fled Ukraine since the invasion began. In addition to the probes, European Union leaders will wrestle with how to reduce their reliance on Russian energy and bolster political and moral support for Ukraine in the face of Moscow's invasion. But it also will rebuff Kiev's appeal for rapid accession to the bloc. Let's cross over to our today in the world new special correspondent Inuka Ponzo from Kleve in Germany for more. Inuka. Yes, Anuradi. As Russia's war in Ukraine enters the third week, a draft declaration showed that the EU will insist Ukraine belongs to their European family, while the leaders are also expected to sign off a new sanctions package that spares Russian fossil fuels. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said everything should be done to put an end to the warmongering, but said damage to EU states from sanctions should be kept at a minimum. Scholz said from Versailles ahead of the summit that the economic impact on Russia is already immense and it is quite clear that the sanctions will continue to have an impact on Russia and the rest of Europe. Neighbouring Austria also pleaded for safe corridors for civilians and said Vienna would help incoming refugees. The EU has imposed unprecedented sanctions on Russia, including cutting seven Russian banks from the SWIFT transaction system targeting Moscow, Ali Belarus and blacklisting Russian state officials and billionaire oligarchs close to the Kremlin. The EU still pays hundreds of millions of dollars every day to Russia, which provides more than 40% of its natural gas, more than a quarter of its oil imports and almost half of its coal. 
Austria, Germany, Hungary and Italy are particularly exposed. Both sanctions and EU enlargement require unanimity among the 27 member states. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Iniko Ponso from Cleve in Germany. It has been an eventful two weeks in regards to the crisis in Ukraine. Debt tolls and displaced citizen numbers continue to climb at an alarmingly fast pace. As the onslaught continues, the first fallen city, Kherson, recuperates as citizens ration what little is left in the controlled area. Kherson, Ukraine offers the first glimpses of Russia's occupation. After two weeks, Kherson is the first and only major city to fall to Russian forces. Last week, its residents were proudly protesting against Russian troops. But that's all changed. Not only they blockade us from, from food uh, and, and medicine and basic necessities, but also they are preparing to imprison uh, those who disagree, those who protest. 400 people were arrested yesterday, according to the Ukrainian military. One big difference, local residents tell us, the appearance of the Rosvagardia, Russia's National Guard. This paramilitary force was created in 2016 and answers directly to President Putin. They're mostly deployed in Russia as riot police. Now they're in Kherson, suppressing dissent the same way they do in Russia. In this video of a protest, Russia's version of a police wagon. The National Guard are checking social media, looking around for their apartments, Kherson's mayor said. They're even looking for the people who were fighting against the Russians in 2014. This city is being strangled. The mayor says they have only about a week of food left. And locals accuse the Russians of looting. In this video, soldiers appear to be pushing a shopping cart full of goods from a store. In another video, a person in a military uniform appears to shoot at the door of an electronics store. When it doesn't open, he busts a hole in the glass. The mayor warned that while Kherson is the first city to face occupation, it won't be the last. This war isn't between Russia and Ukraine, he said. That's just one of the steps for Russia. Russia's fighting right now with Europe and the U.S. An occupation that many here say is on the march. Meanwhile, in Russia, the government is doubtful on whether it should return aeroplanes that were previously leased by countries that are now opposing them. The refusal could affect the already tattered industry and possibly drop it to a new low. Russia may refuse to return hundreds of airliners rented from foreign firms, and that could spark new chaos for an industry already battered by years of lockdowns and soaring oil prices. Russia's airlines have over 500 jets leased from foreign companies, worth billions of dollars. But Western sanctions mean the leasing firms have been given until March 28th to sever ties with the country's carriers. That has led to a game of cat and mouse around the world as lessors attempt to repossess the planes. They're having limited success, with just a handful seized. Now, a draft law published Thursday shows Moscow intends to bar its airlines from returning planes if leases are cancelled. It will also order them to pay for the leases in rubles. Industry experts say it all guarantees years of expensive legal disputes. One told it would mean a decade of lawsuits. Aircraft lessers may hope to get insurance payouts if their planes aren't returned. But that too appears uncertain, with the aviation insurance market seen struggling to make the multi-billion dollar payouts that would be involved. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. And as Russia is being ostracized diplomatically and economically, the burden of supplying the world with necessary goods have fallen on other superpowers. Australia is currently struggling to keep up with demand on various precious items that Russia is now out of the picture for for most countries. Buyers are turning to Australia as they hunt for supplies of coal, gas and wheat to replace cargoes from Russia and Ukraine. But local producers are grappling with a raft of infrastructure and labour constraints. Wheat, coal and LNG prices have soared to record highs as Russia and Ukraine together account for about 30% of the world's wheat trade, while Russia is also one of the world's top exporters of LNG and coal used in power generation. 
Australia is set to ship a record 25.3 million tonnes of wheat this year, but trucking, rail, port and staffing issues mean it won't be able to fill supply gaps, at least in the near term. All the shipping slots are booked up following a second straight year of record crops. And amid a global shipping crunch, the lead times for acquiring extra grain loading gear from overseas has blown out to 12 or 13 months, causing a bottleneck. Coal producers too have been bombarded with calls for supply over the past fortnight from countries like Poland, which have been reliant on Russian supply. But Australia's coal and LNG producers are mostly tied in to contracts. That means they can't divert supplies from those customers. While they won't be able to hike output, coal producers will be able to reap the benefits of soaring prices. For LNG producers, there's no extra gas available to boost output. In fact, LNG exports are expected to be flat or lower than last year. Yet nickel could prove to be a standout on the back of an unprecedented surge in prices. Australia's exports of the metal are forecast to jump by 42% over the year to June. Today marks the 11th anniversary of the massive Tohoku earthquake and tsunami that struck eastern and northeastern Japan, causing a severe nuclear accident. A number of events are being held to commemorate the people who died in the disaster. We have other than a world news special correspondent Anjali Vijayaratna from Fukuoka in Japan for more. Anjali. Yes, I'm ready. The magnitude 9.0 quake hit off the coast of northeast Japan at 2.46 p.m. on March 2011, triggering waves more than 10 meters high. Authorities put the number of deaths and missing people combined at over 18,000. The number of evacuees whose deaths have been certified as related to the disaster has increased over the past year. There were still over 38,000 evacuees as of February, though the number has been declining. The earthquake and tsunami as well as the ensuing nuclear accident caused serious damage, particularly to 40 municipalities, prefectures of these 28 saw their population fall by more than 10% compared to before the disaster. Passing on lessons from the 2011 disaster, a major challenge for Japan, which continues to face the risk of large earthquakes, government estimates of worst-case scenario disasters released last December found that a major earthquake and tsunami of Hokkaido could kill 100,000 people while another earthquake and tsunami of Iwate could kill almost 200,000 of people. Back to you, I'm Rally. All right, thank you. That was Hotha Dena World News Special Correspondent Anjali Vijayaratna from Fukuoka in Japan. Now on to some updates on the COVID pandemic over in the United States. While there was a brief period of freedom enjoyed by travelers in the country due to the dropping of restrictions, time is now up as the country has imposed more mask mandates for transit purposes. Passengers traveling in the U.S. will have to keep their masks on, at least for another month. President Joe Biden's administration plans to extend mask requirements on airplanes, trains and in transit hubs through April 18th as public health authorities review when mass requirements should be dropped. That's according to an administration official. The move extends the current requirements that were set to expire in March. And the extension comes even as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has eased its guidance on indoor masking. In statements on Thursday, the Transportation Security Administration and the CDC said the CDC will work with government agencies on a new policy framework for when and under what circumstances masks should be required in public transportation. Airlines and some government officials told they think this could be the last nationwide extension of the mask requirements. Meanwhile, Chicago-based United Airlines just announced it will allow unvaccinated employees to return to their jobs starting March 28th. It said in a memo that about 2,200 of its employees had received vaccine exceptions for medical or religious reasons and would be welcomed back. United became one of the first U.S. employers to mandate employee vaccines and said most of its workforce complied. The 200 airline employees who were fired for refusing the vaccine without an approved exception will not be back at work. Following monumental efforts from Africa's CDC, it has been announced that Pfizer's Paxlovid fill will soon be available in the continent following a memorandum of understanding between the two organizations, leaving hope for a better recovery numbers in the continent.
Africa's top public health agency has agreed a memorandum of understanding with US pharmaceuticals company Pfizer to bring supplies of its antiviral COVID-19 pills to the continent. That's according to Dr. John Nkengasong, head of the Africa Centers for Disease Control. He said the MOU is currently with the African Union's legal office and, once cleared, a formal announcement would be made. Data from a mid to late stage study in November suggested Pfizer's Paxlovid pill was nearly 90% effective in preventing hospitalizations and deaths compared to a placebo in adults at high risk of severe illness. And Kengasong said African countries should be using a combination of public health measures, vaccines, and testing, as well as treatments like Paxlovid, in their efforts to overcome the COVID 19 pandemic this year. He also expressed concern that vaccination rates remain very low in many African countries. Nkengasong said the Russian invasion of Ukraine had taken a lot of attention away from COVID-19, adding that that was unfortunate, considering that COVID-19 has now killed close to 6 million people. If the deaths of 6 million people doesn't shake us, he said, then I don't know what can shake us in our humanity. South Korea and the U.S. disclosed further details of North Korea's two recent missile launches. The two countries reported that the launches were aimed at testing a new ICBM system. South Korea and the U.S. announced Friday that North Korea's two latest ballistic missile launches on February 27th and March 5th appear to be related to testing its new intercontinental ballistic missile system that was first displayed at a military parade in October 2020. Seoul's defense ministry said intelligence agencies from South Korea and the U.S. assessed that the two launches did not demonstrate full ICBM capabilities in terms of range. But it said they were likely intended to test elements of the new system before a maximum range launch is conducted. The defense ministry added that it strongly condemns launches that violate U.N. Security Council resolutions and raise tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Disclosing information such as this is very rare as normally neither South Korea or the U.S. unveil details of North Korea's missile launches. U.S. Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby said in a statement that the decision was made because the international community must speak in a united voice to oppose the further development of such weapons by the North. He also noted that U.S. forces in the Pacific had stepped up surveillance activities in the West Sea and ordered enhanced readiness among missile defense forces in the region. A U.S. official speaking on condition of anonymity said Washington will be imposing a new round of sanctions on Pyongyang. The official said the government will announce new actions on Friday to help prevent North Korea from advancing its weapons programs, and that this will be followed by a range of further actions in the coming days. But despite international criticism and calls to return to talks, the North, while insisting that it's speeding up efforts to develop reconnaissance satellites, appears to be developing long-range missiles. The North state-run news agency said Friday that its leader Kim Jong-un visited the regime's satellite launch site and ordered the expansion of the launching facility that is capable of firing intercontinental ballistic rockets. Kim visited the Sohae satellite launching ground, which has been used to put a satellite in orbit. But the same facility can also be used to conduct various tests involving technology that requires similar to that used in ICBMs. He called for its modernization so that various rockets can be launched to carry multi-purpose satellites. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. China's seven-day National People's Congress concluded in Beijing with a closing session. Chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress of China, Li Zhangshu, delivered a speech before delegates voted to pass several pieces of leg legislation, including a domestic budget resolution. The International Monetary Fund will cut its global growth forecast to reflect the economic impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. IMF Chief Kristalina Georgieva said they are considering downgrading global growth projections in response. Activists and indigenous groups protested rallying against President Jair Bolsonaro's environmental policies in the Brazilian capital of Brasilia. Dubbed Earth Event, the rally was called by popular singer Satano Veloso and dozens of other Brazilian musicians, who urged legislators to stop what they called the destruction of the Amazon forest. A 57-year-old man who made history as the first person to receive a genetically modified pig's heart died at the University of Maryland Medical Center. David Bennett received the transplant on January 7th, but saw his condition deteriorate several days ago. 
Tiger Woods was inducted into the World Golf Hall of Fame. During the ceremony at the PGA Tour headquarters in Florida, his 14-year-old daughter Sam introduced him for the introduction, while Tiger delivered a speech about his career and those who helped him along the way. A new type of technology has been developed in South Korea that can predict the long-term strength of concrete as building is constructed, possibly preventing lethal building collapses that have been all too frequent in recent years. A high number of structural disasters and apartment building collapses in South Korea have been attributed to issues with the concrete. With that, the Electronics and Telecommunications Research Institute has developed a type of sensor technology that can predict the stability of a building in advance and whether it is at risk of collapse. An optical fiber cable is placed within the concrete, which has sensors to detect the temperature, tension, and if there are any cracks. The core of this technology is to predict the long-term strength of the concrete through measuring the curing process using artificial intelligence of things and ultra-precision optical fiber. The system helps to measure the heat generated during the curing process of the concrete to estimate the long-term strength. It takes into account the concrete mixing ratio, internal temperature and external environment as well. 20 of these sensors in an average four-person household apartment would be enough to detect cracks in the building in advance to prevent fatal accidents. The research team plans to apply this technology to actual construction sites this year. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we are tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight with views of tourists and Venetians dressing up to enjoy another carnival day in the Lagoon City. Thank you for watching. Good night.